functional MRI or fMRI is an imaging technique used to detect task or sensory triggered regional brain activity. In other words, I can touch your nose or have you flex your bicep and actually non-invasively identify the region of the brain that processes that sensory information or controls the muscular contractions that make that movement possible. Since its inception in 1990, fMRI has been used in countless studies examining regional brain activity in relationship to clinical psychiatry, neurocognitive sciences, and preoperative planning of tumor resection near the eloquent areas of the brain to determine the risk of intervention and estimate potential postoperative deficits. Over the next few minutes, we're going to discuss the physiologic and biochemical properties of the brain and blood that make functional MRI possible. To function normally, all the cells in our body need a steady source of oxygen and nutrients provided by the extensive network of arteries and capillaries in our cardiovascular system. Under standard conditions, flowing blood brings the requisite molecules of glucose, fat, and oxygen to our brain, muscles, and organs to basically keep us moving through life. During periods of activity, the regional blood vessels can increase their luminal diameter and supply more nutrients and oxygen to meet demand. In addition, some tissues like skeletal muscles and liver possess local energy and oxygen stores in the form of glycogen and myoglobin, which can be quickly mobilized to supplement the limited blood supply. However, the brain, which utilizes more energy per gram than any other organ in our body, has no such reserve and therefore is highly dependent on a reliable and locally adaptable blood supply. When a group of neurons activate to perform a particular task, local biochemical changes causes the regional arterioles to dilate and thus supply the necessary energy and oxygen. Capitalizing on the unique NMR signal characteristics of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, MRI can be used to indirectly measure local neuronal activity based on this vascular response. Before we get into the details of fMRI, I want to briefly review some relevant biochemistry and a few definitions. We'll start with the definitions. We all learned in high school anatomy about the funky-looking homunculus, depicting the relative volume of sensory or motor neurons dedicated to a particular anatomic region of the body. But that name is actually incomplete. Homunculus simply means little man or little humanoid. In fact, a now famous statue by Dutch artist Marguerite van Brevoort called Homunculus Loxodontus sits in front of the Leiden University Medical Center and, according to the artist herself, symbolizes the emotions of people who wait in the doctor's office. Known affectionately in various post-Soviet Union countries as Zidane, Pokikon, or Pakakon, the Latin translation appropriately means little elephant humanoid. When talking about the neurosciences, our homunculus is a dysmorphic little man whose grotesquely overdeveloped body parts of the hands, lips, and tongue depict the relative volume of cortical brain dedicated to the regional anatomy and therefore is called a cortical homunculus. Our homunculus was developed out of the pioneering work by Dr. Wilder Penfield, shown here in his graduating year at Princeton University in 1913, about five years before obtaining his medical degree from Johns Hopkins University. At the Canadian McGill University in the 1940s, Dr. Penfield refined his techniques on the surgical treatment of severe epilepsy. Using a local anesthetic, he would remove a section of the skull and then stimulate areas of the awake patient's cerebral cortex with a small electrical probe, observing the patient's response to both identify the seizure focus and map out the function of the regional normal brain tissue that may be affected by the surgical resection. This became known as the Montreal Procedure, and the information gleaned from these innumerable cortical mappings was published in 1951, replete with the original motor and sensory cortical homunculi drawings. With functional MRI, we can non-invasively simulate some of Dr. Penfield's mapping work. The key lies in the exquisite biomechanical control of regional cortical blood flow and the distinct differences in the NMR signal of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. With that, we'll briefly review some relevant hemoglobin biochemistry and then put it all together to make an fMR image. Hemoglobin is a metalloprotein containing four subunits, two alpha and two beta. Looking at one of the subunits, there is a watertight globin protein surrounding the non-protonaceous iron-containing heme molecule 
which is attached to the globin chain with a pentagonal histidine amino acid. The ferrous form of iron on the normally functioning heme molecule has six coordinate sites, five of which are occupied by the four attachments of the pyrrole ring, and the fifth to the histidine anchor securing the iron to the proteinaceous globin chain. The free sixth site carries oxygen to all the cells of our body. Fortunately for functional MRI, there is a different NMR signal for oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, which we can utilize to help determine regional brain activity. The magnetic properties of an element or a molecule is largely influenced by the number of paired or unpaired electrons in the valence shell. Elements or molecules with all paired electrons are generally diamagnetic, and exhibit no significant magnetic effect and therefore do not really influence the local NMR signal. On the other hand, elements or molecules with unpaired electrons are generally paramagnetic and in high concentrations can destroy the local NMR signal making these areas darker on a standard spin echo sequence. Oxyhemoglobin has a reddish hue with no unpaired electrons and is therefore diamagnetic with no significant effect on the local NMR signal. When heme gives up its oxygen molecule, it appropriately becomes the bluish deoxyhemoglobin. With four unpaired electrons, the molecule is now paramagnetic. The high concentration of the paramagnetic deoxyhemoglobin in the regional blood cells causes field inhomogeneity and susceptibility artifact from the rapidly dephasing protons, which decreases the local NMR signal. So in summary, Oxyhemoglobin shows up brighter than deoxyhemoglobin on a T2 weighted image, but this is just half the picture. As we stated earlier, metabolically active tissues in the body generally have some form of local oxygen and energy storage that can be readily accessed during periods of high demand. In the liver and muscles, glycogen can be rapidly broken down into glucose for quick energy, and myoglobin is the iron-containing molecule in the skeletal muscles of animals that provides a local oxygen source. However, the brain, the most metabolically active organ in our body, has no such reserves and is therefore highly dependent on a tightly regulated local blood supply. The local blood supply to a group of resting neurons is sufficient to support the basal metabolic needs of the cells themselves. In the arterioles, the incoming blood is highly oxygenated. Again, oxyhemoglobin has a reddish hue and is diamagnetic with no significant effect on the regional MR signal. The neurons extract what they need to stay alive, leaving predominantly the bluish paramagnetic deoxyhemoglobin in the venules. When the neuron activates, immediately the cell extracts more of the available oxygen from the capillaries, leaving a higher percentage of deoxyhemoglobin in the downstream venule. As such, we would expect a significant signal drop off in the region of activated brain due to regional increases in the paramagnetic deoxyhemoglobin. However, the local presence of neurotransmitters induces the support cells around the neurons called astrocytes to release vasoactive chemicals onto the arterioles, causing the vessels to dilate and supply more oxygen and nutrient-rich blood to the working regional neuron. Even though the activated neurons are more efficiently extracting the oxygen from the heme molecules, the increased volume of blood is more than sufficient to meet metabolic demands, and we actually end up with a paradoxical increase in the reddish oxyhemoglobin in the downstream vessels. And since oxyhemoglobin is diamagnetic, there is a relative increase in the local NMR signal compared to the inactive neurons, producing a bright signal in the region of neuronal activity. As you can see, the signal resolution between the active and resting neurons is based on the relative concentration of oxyhemoglobin in the downstream venules and hence this type of imaging is referred to as BOLD or blood oxygen level dependent functional MRI. While BOLD fMRI is a powerful tool in functional brain research, there are some definite inherent limitations of the current technology, predominantly temporal resolution and spatial accuracy. With the requisite neurochemical mechanism of regional blood flow, there is a finite amount of time between neuronal activation and a detectable increase in the downstream diamagnetic oxyhemoglobin. As such, there is an inherent time delay decreasing the temporal resolution between neuronal stimulation and a detectable signal change. Again, since we are indirectly detecting neuronal activity based on the regional increase in the downstream levels of oxyhemoglobin over baseline, Depending on the orientation of the venous drainage, 
signal localization may actually be detected a few millimeters away from the actual neuronal activity. In 2009, C.M. Bennett et al. presented a now famous poster in MR circles entitled Neural Correlates of Interspecies Perspective Taking in the Postmortem Atlantic Salmon, an Argument for Multiple Comparisons Correction. While in the MRI, the researchers showed a dead Atlantic salmon a series of photographs depicting human individuals in various social situations and asked the salmon to determine what emotion the individual in the photo must have been experiencing. Lo and behold, on at least one occasion, the researchers were able to detect significant bold fMRI signal changes within the dead salmon's brain cavity. The poster was not intended to mock or negate the fMRI technology itself, but to raise awareness of the spurious results that can arise from random background noise if multiple comparisons correction aren't routinely utilized when analyzing the raw fMR data. Some of you smart individuals watching this video right now may be able to figure out an MR technique that overcomes these inherent limitations of the bold fMRI methodology. Taking advantage of the high intrinsic spatial and contrast resolution of standard MRI, Multiple EEG pads can be placed on the scalp prior to MR imaging. These special pads would contain a small oil-filled capsule in the region of the contact that would be detected with a standard T1 spin echo sequence and thus serve as multiple fiducial markers. After the scan volume is acquired, each lead pad would be labeled and connected to a specialized EEG machine that could analyze the task-oriented signals emanating from the brain, similar to the constellation of satellites in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth that your cell phone uses to determine your location on the Earth's surface. The system could analyze the relative strength of the new activity in each of the superficial leads and back extrapolate the activity's origin into the 3D MR volume set providing real-time high-resolution functional information.